Hello, my name is Kathy Knapp. I've been attending Trinity for 13 years and volunteering with Lazarus for 12 years. Um, many of you have participated in our yearly uh, health day. Uh, this year it's gonna look a little different and you'll hear more about that later on in the service. As we get ready to worship together, let's quiet our hearts and pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of your goodness to us, for always providing for us, even when it feels like things are missing and things are not as they should be. Um, we just ask that you be with us today as we um, listen to your word and worship together and um, just speak to us, open our eyes and our ears to hear and see what you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise. 
would you lead us, Lord?
wherever you're at, just put your hands out. Let's let this be our prayer. That God, you would empower us, that you would enable us, you would give us your grace. Come, Lord. That what we would put our hands to, the things that we put our efforts to, would be blessed by your Spirit. Establish the work of our hands. Yeah, hear our prayer. Oh, Lord, establish the work of our hands. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's continue worship with a reading from the book of Psalms. This is a portion of Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. I shall keep it with all my heart. Make me go in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Incline my heart to your decrees and not to unjust gain. Turn my eyes from watching what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Fulfill your promise to your servant, which you make to those who fear you, Turn away the reproach for which I dread, because your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments, and your righteousness preserve my life. This is the word of the Lord. Oh 
I'm Brad Malden, I'm the community pastor at Trinity. For the last month, you've heard us talk about living into new rhythms. Now our mission stays the same, right? We're meant to be a people called to grow into Christ's likeness. But because of COVID, we've been invited to live into new rhythms as we live into this mission. And over the last month, you've heard us talk about gathering together on Sunday into smaller groups because we can't come here on Sundays, where we pray together, we get dig into God's word together, we take communion together. You've heard this invitation to engage into small groups as a regular part of our rhythm in life, where we learn together, we challenge each other, encourage each other. And you can look up opportunities like our learning groups or our study groups, but also our neighborhood groups, which are coming back online this week. We encourage you to look online to see how to register for those. These last two weeks, we talked about digging into a more personal devotion life with God so that our life with God on a personal level is continuing to grow. And we have opportunities coming up where you're able to dig into a deeper life of prayer with God or a deeper life into God's Word. You can see some information online about the workshops that are coming up for that. Today, we're talking about loving your neighbor, this invitation to live into, with intentionality, a way to love our neighbor. Now, loving your neighbor is not new, right? COVID hasn't changed the universal call over the last thousands of years to be able to love our neighbor. And that's what it means to be Christian. It's to grow in God and to bear fruit for God and with God. Now we do that individually and we do that collectively. And collectively, the last few months has been such a gift as we watch the Trinity community gather around collectively and to bear fruit, to bless others, to bless those in need. COVID has created a remarkable crisis in our city, but we've responded collectively. In April, we initiated this Love Your Neighbor Fund where we raised over $500,000. And at this point, we've given away about 90% of that to the people in our city who are in our greatest need right now. We've been able to provide aid and assistance to those who are facing food insecurity. We've been able to help people gain access to healthcare who otherwise didn't have access to that. We've been able to help provide educational resources to children who are falling short in education. And we've also been able to pay rent and bills for those families who are facing and wondering how are they gonna face the bills that mount in front of them. It's been an incredible gift to watch our community surround this time of need. But what we know too is that individually, we're called to invest our time and our energy into loving our neighbors. Those can be our literal neighbors to our left and our right, but it's also those neighbors who are in need that we come in contact with. Now those needs in this time can be a little complicated, right? COVID has created some uncertainties of how we invest our energy and our time in person with those who are in need. And the encouragement is that our ministry partners have done an amazing job of pivoting their program to meet this time. You can continue to mentor students, whether that's through Paw Kids Online or Lamy Style or Peace Prep. You can continue to coach soccer through Upper 90 outside. You can also continue to donate goods and services to be able to provide our ministry partners with the things they need, whether that's in the classroom or whether to provide a clean space for kids to learn, or whether that's providing groceries for families in need. The opportunities are plenty. And I encourage you to look on our website because on there you'll be able to learn exactly what those opportunities look like. Now God's not gonna give you a heart for everything, but he's gonna give you a heart for something. And our encouragement and our call in this season is to be able to dig deeper into where he is calling us to be a loving and a good and generous neighbor. Now, individually, we also have a unique opportunity right now. Typically at this time of year, in the beginning of September, we're trying to amp up our community to be able to engage and anticipate Health Day. Health Day is with our ministry partner called Lazarus. And for over a decade now, we've been doing a big event in September where we provide healthcare access to people in our city who are homeless, men and women who don't have access to healthcare. Get this on a health day in the past, we'd have seven, 800 people and it's a fun festival event, lots of energy and lots of care and love being able to give to the men and women in our city who face incredible challenges because of the homelessness. Now, we can't do that collectively. And the good news is that Lazarus is still able to do their ministry. They're gonna provide personalized care and provide access to healthcare for these men and women. But instead of us being able to gather on that particular day, we have an opportunity as individuals to be able to still come alongside the good work Lazarus is doing. Now in the past at Health Day, the men and women who came to receive those services would leave with an incredible little hygiene kit, which was full of good things that were very practical and caring and loving. It was like a gift bag for the men and women who would show up on that day. And it had water and snacks, things like a fresh pair of socks or soap, uh, things that just help make life a little bit easier for the challenges these men and women face. Obviously, we can't do that on one particular day, but as a community, we can still come alongside that same sentiment. And we want to challenge our community to be able to still continue to create these hygiene kits. 
Now what I'd like to see is for us as a community is to create 750 hygiene kits so that Lazarus, as they continue to do the work that they do week in and week out, is equipped to be able to take those bags and give them as a gift to the men and women they love on a weekly basis. These hygiene kits are going to be an incredible gift and remind the homeless men and women in our city that they are seen and they are loved. These are our brothers and our sisters, and it's an invitation to love them with intentionality and care. And we're excited to be able to do that and to challenge our community to live into this invitation. And so what I want to do is over the next two weeks is to challenge our community to come up with 750 of these kits. Now look online and you'll get a lot of instructions and specifics about the details for these kits. But between now and September 20th, go out, get a Ziploc bag, fill these bags up, and let's do together, individually, the work that God calls us to do so that collectively we can bear great fruit for our city. Look online on our website for more information, and God bless you. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be with you. Welcome to church. My name is Ashley Matthews. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity on the West Side. We are so glad to have you with us. If you have Bibles, you can go ahead and get those out. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. And while you're grabbing your Bible, I just want to give you a quick reminder about communion. After the last few weeks, we've been making communion kits available here on the West Side for you all to come by and grab so that you can celebrate communion together, either by yourself or with those you're watching church together with on Sundays. And I just want to say it's been so good to see your faces here. We're going to be here again today from 4 to 6 p.m. and Sundays going forward. Uh, so mark your calendar so that you have an opportunity to come by and see some of our pastors will be here, our staff will be here. It's been such a great opportunity to connect with people uh, in the ways that we're able and to be able to celebrate communion together feels like a real gift. Uh, so that's again today at 4 to 6 p.m. and every Sunday going forward. All right, if you have Bibles, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be talking today about um, the church, about relationships in the church. And uh, it just has, feels important to say it has felt like a pretty timely word to me. Uh, this season has been so discouraging and frustrating and even painful in so many ways. And as I've been sitting with people, I've heard people ask, you know, what does it even mean to belong to the church at a time like this? when we're so divided socially and politically, when we literally can't be together in the same space, what does it really even mean to, to be the church? And it's such an important question. And when I really do believe um, that the Lord has something to say in response to today. So Matthew 18, verse 15. These are the words of Jesus. He says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you today, God, for the gift of your word. We thank you, Jesus, for the gift of your presence with us wherever we are. And I want to ask you, Lord, especially that you would today, through your spirit, Lord, gather us to you as the church, as your body. And even though, Lord, we are scattered apart from one another, we ask you, Lord, that for a special awareness, Lord, of what it means to belong to your body, to you, and to each other, Will you give us the wisdom of heaven, Lord, your grace, your help? It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Amen. So this entire chapter uh, really is about relationships, uh, what it means uh, to belong to the family of God. And the NRSV translates verse 15 to start uh, this, this passage that we read as um, if another member of the church sins against you, 
uh, then ex- yada, 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 go, go and do such and such a thing. But if another member of the church sins against you, and I think that's interesting because actually uh, in the Greek, what the language says is if another brother or sister sins against you, go and do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I just to start, I feel like this distinction really matters because membership is one of those things that just sort of comes and goes these days, maybe especially. But uh, to be brother and sister, to belong to the kind of family that Jesus believed to be himself to be creating, is to say, like, we're, we're a part of something together. We're made of the same stuff. And whatever it is that binds us to each other and connects us is bigger than any one of us. And so how we go through conflict, for example, really matters. Apparently, Jesus thought it was really important to spend some time after he's called us to be like little ones, to be like children, to desire belonging more than we desire to be ahead of each other. Jesus then goes in to give these really practical examples in verse 15 of what it looks like to navigate inevitable conflict uh, when you're a part of a family, when you belong to each other. And so he gives these four steps, uh, basically, four things to do when you find yourself in conflict uh, with each other. And I just want us to walk through them a step at a time. They've been so helpful and instructive to me. And I hope that they will be to you as well. Jesus says, firstly, that we have to face it. Um, So I have to deal with my hurt. I don't get to just bury it or pretend it's not there or ignore it and move away from it. Um, Because if we don't treat our wounds, if we don't deal with our pain, if we don't face them, then like a wound, that pain begins to fester. All wounds left untreated, if they're serious enough, will do exactly that. We've said this before in weeks past, some of what we're experiencing in the church, particularly with respect to race right now, feels exactly like that. It it is a wound that we have for too long left untreated. And so, when a wound begins to manifest symptoms of neglect or infection, the, the response is not to be mad at the symptom, right? The, the more helpful, um, the more constructive response rather is to, to ask myself the question, what did I do or not do? What did we do or not do to get us here? And maybe even as important to ask, what do we do now to deal with it or to treat it? So Jesus is calling us firstly to face it, to be willing to face the things that hurt us, to deal with our pain. And it's a really important thing to name and say. And then secondly, he's going to say, I go to the source of that pain before I take it to someone else. Uh, So if I'm hurt, I'm going to take it firstly to the person who's hurt me before I go somewhere else. Now, let's just talk real life for a second, what this actually looks like for me. If someone hurts my feelings, Um, or violates my trust in some way. Uh, Here's what I do. I usually call my person or a couple of people. I hope you have your people. They're the people that you feel very free to sort of like dump your ugly on and work stuff out with. Uh, You know who that person is for you. And I call my person or my people and work through my feelings. I talk through what happened. And I just, to say, to relieve some guilt, I think that's actually a really healthy and wise thing to do. Because if you have good people, assuming your person is a wise and can be neutral person, uh, what my people help me do is sort of sort through my feelings to figure out what parts of what I'm feeling are really valid and what parts of what I'm feeling really aren't. And need to just, rather than being talked through, I need to deal with on my own. And after I've done that, I pray. So I talk to my person I pray, and then Jesus is saying, we we go to the person, to the source, and we deal with things um, face to face. I love what he says so much um, about this because the language that he uses, I think, is really important. I think it's really specific. Jesus is saying, I want you to go to this person. I want you to deal with it privately, which is another important thing to point out. It means we don't get to air out our grievances in public. Um, or in public forums, be they online or otherwise. If we have issues, we're supposed to go to the person, do it privately. And Jesus says, if they listen to you, then you have, the language he uses is, you have regained your brother or your sister, which is a really powerful way to think about that, because what Jesus is saying is, you have reclaimed something really valuable that you almost lost, something that in and of itself, that relationship, Jesus is saying, has value. 
And I think that's important to say because what that means to me and I hope to all of us is that Jesus is saying our relationships with each other, particularly within the church, they have kingdom value. They, they're like an asset that can do things. And if we lose them, then we've lost something of immense worth. It's kind of like, if you think about that in terms of like what has great value in the world, well, money, of course, is a, is a source, it's an asset, a resource that has great value, and it can be spent in a number of ways. It's the means by which we acquire things or build things or do things in the world. What if what Jesus is saying is, in part, our unity, our connection to each other is a valuable asset. It's like a resource that when we have it in great quantities, we are able to acquire and build and do things for the kingdom of heaven. And when we don't have that unity, when we've lost that relationship and connection to each other, we've lost a resource, something of immense value. And therefore, we're less able to do the things um, that we would otherwise be able to do. So that's important. Jesus says, I need to deal with it. I have to deal with my pain. I have to deal with it by going to the person or the source of my pain directly and privately. And then thirdly, he says, I um, am to invite one or two people that the other person also trusts, I think is an important distinction to make, into the situation. So it's probably not a great idea. Uh, Jesus says, you know, if you go to them uh, one-on-one and it doesn't work out, they don't listen to you, uh, Go back again, and this time, take a couple of people with you. Uh, now, here's my recommendation. Jesus doesn't say this. I just think it's um, maybe based on experience. If I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna take people into a situation, it needs to be a couple of people we both mutually love and trust, people with whom we both have equity. If I take two of my people into a situation um, to have my back or to defend or support me, then that's probably not go, gonna go a terrible long way in building a unity or reconciliation. What we really want is like shared equity, mutual connection. And here's why that's so important and why I think it's so brilliant what Jesus is saying. What that assumes, what Jesus is really calling us to do then, is to do everything we can to try to be heard and to do it in a way that the other person actually can hear and move towards us. What Jesus assumes really is that I would care most about loving you well. I would care more about that than I would care about being right. And if that's true of me, if what I really do want is reconciliation and for us to be able to be well and to be restored, then I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that to set you up to hear what I have to say rather than to just be most concerned with proving my own point. And I think that's really brilliant. It feels um, important and it feels a lot like Jesus to me. I also think it's a really timely word for a moment like the one um, we're in. Because we in the church do have a responsibility, of course, to consider how we speak truth. We are called to speak the truth, and we're called to do it in love. And in a moment like the one we're in, that feels really important to say. Our only options, y'all, cannot be either we remain silent or we say what's true however it suits me in a moment. I'm either going to remain silent or I'm going to say it however it suits me. Those cannot be our only options. Now, responding to something out of acute pain is another thing. Everybody gets, um, has the right to respond to acute pain and to do it however they have to do it. But what Jesus is assuming is that I've now created enough space to give thoughtful consideration to how I'm going to mend a situation. And then I'm going to have to do that by speaking truth, and I'm going to have to do that by speaking the truth in love. That's our responsibility. It's how we work things out together uh, in the church. Jesus is saying, and then he's going to go on to say, fourthly, uh, if that doesn't work, um, you've gone to the person on your own, you've gone to the person with a couple of trusted people or maybe one other trusted person, then Jesus says um, that we are to take it to the church. And this is one of those instances, um, and this is always true, I suppose, where context really matters. Because, of course, what Jesus has in mind when he says, take it to the church, is a small gathering of people, um, particularly in the first century, if we're thinking of the church that Jesus would have been referring to and speaking about, these were small clusters of Christians who were gathered together and who were living their lives in close proximity to one another. They were committed to each other. They'd built a lot of relationship and trust uh, with each other. 
And that is so important because in the absence of that kind of proximity and that kind of trust, doing something like what Jesus is suggesting that we do, take it to the church is not only probably not helpful, but it's like horrible and horrific to even imagine or think about. Uh, so let me just say for the record, there will never be a day, for example, when we invite someone to stand in front of the church here at Trinity to air out our sin. And that's because it wouldn't accomplish the thing that Jesus intends to accomplish, um, which is that there would be reconciliation. We don't live in close enough proximity to one another. Not everybody in this room could possibly have the kind of equity that would be required. It would be shameful. It would only reinforce pain and hurt. And shame is always a hellish strategy. It never heals. It never restores. It cannot be our strategy for the way that we're dealing with our disagreement. We cannot possibly believe that if I could just shame this person into agreeing with me, that that, that, that would work. If what we're really hoping for is agreement and unity, then shame can never be our strategy or our um, tactic. It just, it will never bear fruit. Uh, it will never work. I also think it's important to note that there is a difference, I know for myself, in feeling in shame um, and then feeling conviction, which is, of course, a really good and right thing to feel. If people I love come to me and say, um, what you're doing has hurt us and it's wrong, and I feel badly about that, that isn't necessarily shame. It can turn into that. But if um, the way it's intended to work is if I feel badly, I'm to assume that's probably conviction. And if I'll allow it, the Holy, invite the Holy Spirit into a place like that, then that conviction can, in fact, lead me into right relationship, both with God and with the people around me. So in that way, it's, Jesus is saying that kind, of, that kind of discomfort can actually be really good for us. And then lastly, number four, Jesus says, if none of this works, then treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, we could infer a number of meanings um, from what Jesus is saying. We could assume that what he means, therefore, is that if somebody refuses to see it the way I see it or to um, admit what, the wrong that has, um, what wrong has been done to me, well, then I can just write them off. I could ignore them. I could break relationship with them, keep a safe distance, pity them from afar because they just you know, couldn't see the truth. Or we could assume... I think we're meant to assume that we ought to treat them the way that Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors, which means that he, we would be to treat them the way that Jesus treated the centurion who came to him to ask that his servant be healed, that we would treat them the way that Jesus treated Zacchaeus, the tax collector, when he went and sat at his table and had a meal with him while well, everyone sort of scoffed behind the scenes. In other words, Jesus treated people with mercy and with a persistent hope for reconciliation, always looking for opportunities to draw people in, to bring them close. I wonder if that's what he means to those who have ears to hear and, and eyes to see, that that would be the assumption of the gospel. I was thinking about that a lot and how I've read it differently in the past. That's what Jesus is saying. We can just you know, there comes a point when we break relationship, and there may be a point for you in some of your relationships where you, you can't stay connected to one another in the same way. Because, of course, it is true that we cannot pretend all is well when things are not well. We cannot afford to overlook injustice. We cannot afford to ignore the call to holiness. Those things we do have to tend to, they are important, and we have to be committed to working them out together and to creating enough space with each other when we've like run into a wall. That's also healthy and good. But it's important to say that Jesus does not give us a license to write one another off when we disagree. That does not come from him. Jesus, it is not Jesus that tempts me or prompts me to want to knowingly offend or vilify or demonize or cancel people when they disagree with me. It's everywhere around us, but we have to know, those of us who belong to him, that doesn't come from him. Jesus is the one who taught us to love our enemies, not just people who disagree with us, but our actual enemies. 
Jesus is the one who taught us to bless those who curse us and to pray for those who abuse us. And so when and if we are going to say things like the gospel is sort of inherently offensive, of course people are going to offend and we can't be afraid to make people uncomfortable. To a degree, that's true. Jesus did offend people. He did make people uncomfortable. But do you know what the most offensive thing about Jesus was? Ultimately, it was his pursuit of love. That's what offended people the most and made them the most uncomfortable, was how committed Jesus seemed to be to drawing in people who were on the outside. The gospel is not now, nor has it ever been, a license to malign those with whom we do not agree. The gospel is the balm of heaven. At its best, mostly. That's what it is. Colossians 1 Paul says God is through Jesus reconciling all things to himself. And then he did that through the blood of Jesus on the cross. And then he did that for the sake of people who were enemies of God in their mind. That's the gospel. It is a force of peace and goodness, not at the expense of truth, not at the expense of real justice but we have to be committed to holding on to what is true about the gospel, about Jesus, and about each other. One of the bright spots for me in the last few months has been the song we've been singing uh, every now and then here at Trinity called The Blessing. What a powerful song, and what a timely song. Um, If you remember, it's a song that says, The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I had the opportunity, a number of us did, about 13,000 of us, in fact, had the opportunity to sing that song together at one race back in June. Thousands of Christians all gathered in downtown Atlanta with our hands extended, speaking words of peace and blessing over each other. And I will tell you, it was for me one of the most powerful moments in my life because at a season and a moment like this, to be able to open my eyes and look in my city, the city that I love, and see thousands of Christians with their hands extended towards one another, people of all races, rich and poor, all political affiliations, and choosing to say, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, and not just you, but on your children and your children's children. I had a moment of realizing this is what it means to be the church. Or this is what it ought to mean to be the church. And some of us are just going to have to choose to believe, to decide that that's what it means to be the church. That we belong to Jesus and we therefore belong to a very long line of broken people. When we talk about the church, we're not talking about Trinity or a building or any other building in the city. We're talking about this worldwide body that stretches across all races and places connected to Jesus. Choosing to belong to him and to each other. Which means that my brother or sister next to me is neither as bad or as broken as I am tempted or the enemy would tempt me to believe they are. That's what it means to be the church. So we have a few questions to consider together uh, for you to reflect on in your homes, however you would like to do this. If you need to pause the video, you can. We want to make space each week uh, for you to have time for personal reflection or to talk about things together as a group. I'll read the questions and then you'll have them available for you on the screen. The first If you could change one thing about the way you handle conflict, what would it be? Maybe you write it down, offer it up to the Lord in prayer. And secondly, can you recall a time when a hard conflict was dealt with in a way that was redemptive? When you experienced restoration either with a group of people or with another person? Again, call it to mind, offer it up as a a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord, maybe encourage each other with it. Amen. We're going to prepare now to pray together. This is also an opportunity for you all to go and gather your communion kits so that you can receive communion together um, when we close our time. Also want to remind those of you who belong to Trinity, if you call Trinity home, 
we want to invite you to continue giving to support the mission of this church. You can do that by going to our website. We would normally go forward together and um, give our offerings in the basket, but now we uh, all have to do that online. And so you can go to the website, go to the west side page. You'll see an opportunity to give there. If you are not um, a member of Trinity, if Trinity isn't your home church, if you're joining us from elsewhere, somewhere else in the country or in the city, but you have a home church, we're so glad that you're with us and joining us for worship, but please don't give. Uh, give your offering, give your money to your local church to support the good work being done uh, wherever you live and for the sake of your neighbors. All right, let's stand together if we're able and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.